All right, everyone. Uh, we're happy to have our first in-person seminar with the uh, fully in-person, I guess, with Bahid. Uh, our own Bahid is presenting us some recent work of his with some other collaborators in a, another Canadian university uh, on worst case garbage case reductions by additive combinatorics. Okay, take it away, Bahid. Uh, thank you, Rafael, and thank you everyone for coming. It's, it's very nice to see uh, uh, people in person. So I'm going to talk about uh, my recent work in the worst case to average case reduction uh, via additive combinatorics. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, Sasha Golovnev, Tom Gur, and Igor Shinkar. And okay, so I wish I could get rid of that thing somehow. But... Oh, you should do it on more things. I guess. Like more on the right side of that bar. Oh, yeah. I give you control, control all shift H very intuitive. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so the, the question that uh, we are interested in in this work is that suppose we have a problem and we know that we can solve that problem on a few instances. Is it, is it possible to construct like a general solution for all instances of, of that problem or is, is it hard? And oops. Okay, and there are general, generally there are like two perspectives uh, about this kind of worst case to average case reductions. The first or the optimist uh, perspective is that uh, if you if you know that you can you can solve a problem for a few instances, then maybe you can hope that you can generalize that that solution for all instances and uh, like construct better algorithms for for difficult problems. And there is also a pessimist uh, perspective that is usually I mean it's very common in in, in cryptography. And if if you want to show a problem is hard, if if you're conjecturing that the problem is hard. Then it would be great if you can show that it's even hard for, for, for some random instances. And in this work, uh, our main result is that we basically construct a new framework to prove worst case to average case reductions. And we use some uh, techniques from additive combinatorics to, uh, to basically construct this uh, framework. And in this paper, we show a few examples of uh, how, how to use this framework. We show worst case to average case reductions for matrix multiplication, for data structures, for uh, linear problems, for online matrix vector multiplication, and for some weak average case reduction in, in uh, polynomial evaluation. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, algorithms for matrix multiplication as an example of uh, how, how this uh, technique works. By the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have any questions. Uh, okay, so let's let's start by reviewing some basics about uh, matrix multiplication. So as you all know, uh, product of two matrices is defined basically like this, not, not very formal. But, uh, and we know that there are like n squared uh, entries in, in, in results. And you can compute every single one of them by O and O of n, like linear operations. Therefore, a naive algorithm is uh, runs in like n cube. And also, it's uh, clear that input size is like n squared, so uh, trivial lower bound is uh, n squared for matrix multiplication. But there are definitely better algorithms to do that. Uh, a Strassen algorithm does this in uh, n to the power two point eight. Copper Smith, Vinograd, n to the power 2.3, and recently Alman and Vasilevska Williams in 2. n to the power 2.3, uh, 7 to 8, 6, or uh, something close to that. And a very like important, a huge problem, open problem in this uh, in this line of research is whether there exists an algorithm that solves uh, matrix multiplication in uh, time O and squared. So we don't know how to do that in uh, uh, in quadratic time, but what can we say about uh, heuristics for matrix multiplication? For example, is it is it possible to to solve 
this problem with, with a quadratic algorithm that works only like uh, sometimes or like a very few uh, instances of uh, possible inputs. And what if, for example, we want our algorithm to uh, work only on 99% of the possible inputs or 1% of possible inputs? And in general, how do we actually formalize this? Because I mean, if, you, if you think of uh, matrices over reals or over integers, it, it kind of uh, doesn't make sense uh, to say about a fraction of possible input on, inputs unless you uh, consider like uh, some distributions uh, over that domain. And well, instead of thinking about reals or integers because they're kind of hard to work with, we, we just consider matrices modulo some prime numbers. So the problem is as follows. We, we are given two n by n matrices in, uh, in field FP, and we want to compute uh, their, their product uh, module prime P. And the observation is that if all entries of the matrices are in, in the range minus k to k, then each entry in the result in, in the range minus n k squared to n k squared. And then if, if you can solve this uh, problem, uh, modulo every prime number that's less than log n k squared in, in time t, then we can solve it basically for integers in uh, time, uh, time t again. And the proof idea is to just uh, compute this matrix multiplication for some prime numbers and use like Chinese remainder theorem to uh, generalize the answer over integers. Is this, is this like a new thing that you guys did or? No, it's, it's just, it's just some, well, no, no. yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, so the question that we ask is we want we want to show, or we want to construct algorithms for matrix multiplication, modulo primes that succeed on like 99% of the possible inputs or 1% of the possible inputs. So this, this question now makes sense because we were thinking about uh, matrices in, in where, where their entries in com comes from some finite field. So it makes sense to, uh, so because we have like finite possible many, uh, Finitely possible, possible many inputs. It makes sense to uh, define define a notion of like one percent or nine nine percent. Okay. So, in, any any questions so far? This is sort of implicitly assuming against the uniform distribution of the inputs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the main result that we prove is that. Suppose we have an algorithm that gets two n by n matrices, uh, a, b over from, from this finite field. And this algorithm runs in time t. And we know that this algorithm outputs the correct answer with probability alpha, where probability is over uh, choices of a, b, and possibly randomization of the algorithm itself. And then, we prove that there is an algorithm that we call alg star that gets basically the same uh, two matrices. It, run, it runs in time O alpha of T, so it has a constant that depends on alpha. And it computes the matrix multiplication, product of A and B, uh, with, with high probability, with probability 99%, but for all the possible inputs A and B. Okay, so, so this, this probability doesn't depend on A and B, it just depends on the randomization of algorithm. And we, we think of alpha as, as uh, some, some constant, like possibly 1%. I mean, it can even be sub-constant, but for, for, for this type, I'm, I'm just gonna assume that it's, it's a very like, tiny constant. So this basically means that if, if like, the original algorithm succeeds in 1% of uh, possible inputs, then Alex star succeeds on all inputs with, with high probability. Uh, what, is the uh, what is the dependence of uh, all sub alpha on, uh, on uh, alpha? Let's say that alpha uh, is, a, uh, is a constant that depends on P. Um, 
So alpha does, does not depend on p. Alpha is just some. Uh, no, no. So I thought what the statement says is that for any alpha, if we have the top statement, then uh, we can get an algorithm out of the star that will achieve that uh, probability. Right. Isn't it for any alpha? So for, so for any it, constant alpha, for example. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what if the alpha is a one over p? Uh, so, so if if p is, a, I mean, if you think of p as a constant, then uh, then the the dependence on alpha can can be like exponential, but at the end, like exponential and constant is, is constant. Right? Alpha is like one over n. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, I was thinking uh, in terms of asymptotics. So let's say that the p depends on n, and alpha is something like uh, one over p or something like that. Uh, So it, it doesn't quite work for one over n because 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 for example if if uh, if the if the dependence on alpha is exponential we, we, which in this case is exponential if if it's one over n then exponential in like one over one over n is is is, is not like a good uh, constant. Uh, another question. Yeah. So. How is this related? So we know that there's an old result from the permanent, right? They use the self-reducibility of the permanent that says that if you can compute the permanent in a small like set of points, then you can also compute the permanent uh, exactly in the whole space. Do you know this result? I know from the 80s complexity. I don't remember who, but uh, do you remember Richard? Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, I, I think I've heard about the result, but I, I don't know about like direct relation between the two. Okay, okay. I'll ask you more later. Okay. Also, what's the dependence on alpha? Like, you always have alpha analysis. So, think, think of it as like exponential in alpha. Okay, is it like multiplicative exponential? Or is it like... So, it's like two to the power of alpha times t, something like that. Two to the Alpha and t is in the exponent. Well, sorry, two, two, two to the power one over alpha times t. Okay, okay, so if, if it's like one one percent, then it's two to the power, to the power one hundred times t. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay, cool. So sort of fixed parameter the factors. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, that's a little really this, but what about the dependence on p? Is it somehow really constant with respect to p, or is it? Uh, so we we think of p, p as a constant. Okay. Right. okay. So it, it actually. Okay, I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but if, if the field size is like uh, is large, then we it's actually easy to, to to prove such a result. We can you can do we can we can basically write this matrix multiplication as some sort of like low degree polynomial evaluation, and we we can do some uh, techniques of uh, uh, so the hard cases on this. Yeah. Okay. So, for, for example, it's, it's not clear how to do it when when uh, field is binary. Uh -huh. And the the first algorithm, like the, the supposed case one percent, that can literally be any one percent of the uh, inputs, yeah. like adversarially chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Uh, okay. Great. So let's continue. So let's say uh, so. So before before going going to like see the technique, I'm I'm, I'm going to briefly review some some known results about this uh, this like matrix multiplication and some like easier techniques that we can use. And in particular, suppose that the original algorithm that's given to us succeeds on like ninety nine percent of inputs. Okay and. Uh, if, if we know that a success probability is greater than 99%, we can do a like BLR style uh, linear correction to, to, to do like average case to worst case reduction. And how, how does that work? Uh, suppose Alex Star, the new algorithm, gets A and B, and it does the following it basically samples uh, two random n by n matrices R and S. And it makes four calls to, to the original algorithm. It calls it on Rs, A minus R times S, 
R times B minus S and A minus R times B minus S. And then reports, uh, I mean, returns the sum of these like four calls. Uh, so it's clear that the running time of uh, this is, I mean, these two are basically identical uh, because it just makes four calls to, uh, to the original algorithm. You want us to say, like, what is BLR style? Like, or what is BLR? So, yeah, it's, it's, we go back to this. Yeah. So, so, I mean, to, to briefly, uh, so, so first about like Gotham question. So BLR saw is like this technique by uh, Bloom, Luby and Rubenfu that they, they show that to, to like prove a function is linear, you can basically sample three points and uh, uh, check whether those three points are linear or not. And the idea is that, okay, so if, if we, uh, if, if you write the sum as, as, as the following, what we get at the end is A times B. So those like random matrices cancel out. And the important observation is that uh, because we are, like, we are sampling R and S, Uniformly at random, these uh, uh, all, all these four matrices. I mean, they're dependent, but their their distribution is uniform. So, uh, so with probability ninety nine percent, each one of them can be. Uh, I mean, the original algorithm will return the correct answer for each one. Okay, yeah, so so this this way we can we can we can construct an algorithm that works for all inputs uh, with, with high probability. And, and we, we actually can uh, like boost the success quality by repeating it like constantly many times and, and take the majority work. Okay, so, so let, let's see what we need for, for I mean, what, what's the bound we get for, for this algorithm to be, to be correct. So suppose the algorithm succeeds with probability one minus delta and we, we want to like, we want to construct an algorithm that's correct on every input with probability 99%. So what, what constraints we get on Delta? So we know that uh, if, if we want majority to succeed, we have, we, we need to get one minus four Delta to be greater than one half. Okay, and uh, this basically means that the original algorithm should succeed with probability greater than seven over eight. And what if, what if, uh, the original algorithm, for example, so I said we go to probability three quarters, greater than three quarters. So we still can uh, do something about that. And we will see that, I mean, the algorithm is basically the same. It does the same thing. But here, uh, if, if, you, if you wanna do union bound, what we get is that uh, with the probability greater than, uh, for like four times epsilon, this, this, all, all, all these four uh, calls to the original algorithm will return the correct answer. And we, and we can compute the correct answer using that. Okay. So it's, it's not much for, I mean, four times epsilon, but the good thing about matrix multiplication, I mean, the, the key observation here is that we can actually verify the answer in times, uh, in time O and squared. And how does that work? So it's basically the famous uh, Fravel's algorithm that takes like three inputs A, B, C, and it wants to verify whether A times B equals C. And what it does is that for, for constant, I mean, suppose we like repeat this process constantly many times, and each time we pick a random uh, vector uh, from zero, one to N, or, or, or the field, like the prime field to the N. And I mean, we, we define each entry to be uniformly at random. And we compute uh, A times B times R and also C times R and check whether these, these two are equal. And it, it, it is, uh, I mean, it can be computed in uh, quadratic time because instead of computing A times B times R, we can first compute B times R and then multiply it by A. Okay, so, so to get an algorithm that succeeds on 70, like, I mean, to convert an algorithm that succeeds on 76 
percent of the inputs to an algorithm for for all possible inputs uh we can basically do the blr like reduction uh we add this like verification step at the end and if this the, if the answer is like incorrect we, we just repeat the whole process again and if you if we for example repeat i don't know 10 times i mean 10 over epsilon times we we get the correct answer uh with high probability So, so the conclusion from uh, from this part is that uh, if if we can come up with, with an idea that uh, finds the correct answer with some uh, positive probability, even even if it's very tiny, we can actually do something useful with that. Okay. So, so any any questions so far? Okay, great. So let's. Uh, I mean, after after this, like relatively long introduction, we can talk about the main result. So I'm going to state the main result again. I mean, we have seen this before, but uh, so we want to show that if uh, we, we can reduce an algorithm that succeeds on like 1% of the inputs, or even an alpha that's like one over square, square root log n. So if alpha is like one over n, it's it's uh, it's very small for for this reduction to work. But we, we we can we can get something for like something that's one over square root log n or something like that. And then we can com convert that algorithm to to an algorithm that succeeds on all inputs with high probability. And let me make some assumptions first to like make it a bit uh easier so let's assume that the original algorithm is deterministic also let's assume that uh that for for the input a b that's given to us we, we have this probability so what it says is basically that so so remember that the original algorithm succeeds on like one percent of the inputs and it's quite possible that for some a or for many a's uh the algorithm sees if, if it's like one of those special A's, it just outputs some junk. And I mean, it doesn't, it always out outputs the wrong answer. So this assumption basically says that the A that's given to us is a good A. So we know that with some like constant probability, the, the, uh, the algorithm would output the correct answer for, for, for this input A. So we just need to focus on uh, like self-correcting B in, in, in this part. And uh, we assume that uh, we know A. But... I mean, A and B is given to us, yeah. Oh, okay. And we also assume that alpha is constant. And we we just assume that field is binary, so it's just zero and one. Okay. So again, the, the, we, we just assume that we, we fix an A, that's good. And we, we take about, we want to do like self-correction uh, for peace. So let's define this set X, which is basically the set of good B's for, for that, uh, that specific A. So it's a, it's a set that depends on A. And it's, it's basically the set of good B's for, for, for that particular A. Then we, we know that like density of this set is greater or equal than alpha times uh, set of like all possible matrices B. And we want to construct an algorithm that works as follows. So first of all, we know that if B belongs to S, then we can basically run the original algorithm and get the correct answer, right? So we did this list by like, case is very easy, but if B is not in X, then we hope that we can write B as some of some matrices M1, M2, and hope that maybe M1 and M2 belong to X, or maybe M1, M2, M3, M4. Yep. So I'm guessing the other itself doesn't know X, so is the case not the case breakdown is for the analysis, or is it an actual thing in the algorithm? No, we'll see that we, we, we don't know what X is. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. So but after writing it, you can always check it with an X, but right. like uh, doing the verification. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah that, that, that's the key point so we, after after doing i mean we, we blindly do some some uh self-correction and at the end we can check whether what we did was correct or not so why why in this case plr test doesn't work well basically suppose suppose the algorithm that's but given to us works as follows it given a and b it checks whether the first entry of a equals to zero or equal to one or equals to one and if it equals to zero it outputs the correct answer and if it equals to one it just outputs some junk so in this case, we know that alpha is like one half, but it's kind of, I mean, it's not hard to see that if, if, the, if a matrix P that's given to us has one in its first entry, we, we can't basically write it as some of some matrices that all have zero on, on, on first entry, right? So that's basically the intuition why, why uh, BLR test uh, or, or BLR reduction doesn't work in this, uh, like low agreement regime. So we need something more, and uh, we're going to use some techniques from additive combinatorics. So we define in, in additive combinatorics, we define some sets, and we define it as follows. So for a set X, we define X plus X to be a set of all possible, like little X plus little X primes, where both X and X prime belong to X. And similarly, we can define 3x or, or tx. And if we feel like we continue this uh, process, we eventually get to a span of x, right? But the idea behind additive combinatorics is to, uh, to show some nice structures in, in like these smaller sum sets, 2x, 3x, 4x, or so, so on. And, and the like, general idea is, is to show that uh, uh, I mean, these like small sum sets have some are on like good approximations of, of subgroups. So the main the main lemma that we use is something known as Bogdanov's lemma, which is like quite old from like seventy or eighty years ago, and it it is basically the following thing. Suppose we have a set X, and we know that like density of this uh, set is like at least alpha. Then the lemma states that there exists a subspace V uh, in 4x, and dimension of V is n minus 1 over alpha squared. Okay. So, so is this statement clear? Should that be surprising? Yes. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's I guess it's, it, it, is, it is a nice result, but it's, it's not very hard to prove. I mean, at least this, this version is not. Uh, I mean, basically follows from some uh, simple calculations of Fourier analysis. But yeah, this is. Is, is it even obvious? Like, maybe it is obvious, maybe it's not, but like, is it obvious that span affects this full rank? Uh, it doesn't have to be, but then uh, the minus one by alpha squared make kind of that. Sure, sure. I'm just curious, like how significant that is. Okay, anyway, sorry. Go on, go on. Okay, so so yeah, this this lemma is uh, I mean itself I think is is, is a nice lemma, but I mean in, in this form it's it's not clear how how we can use it for self correction because it just states that there exists a, like subspace in this sum set, but we, we don't know any, anything about the subspace. So we need a probabilistic version of this lemma, which is the following. So again, we have a set X, and we know that there exists a subspace V in 4X, and, uh, and the dimension of like V is N minus one over alpha squared. And we also know that if we take, like if we sample three random Xs from, uh, from the entire space, and and like take take a uh, okay. Let, let me say it this way: consider any point in subspace. Then, if we take three random points uh, from from the entire space and set the four point to be v minus x one x three x four, then the probability that all those four points belong to the original set x is greater than alpha to the power of five. Okay. 
So it basically means that uh, not only there exists a subspace V in 4X, but for every V, every little V in V, there are like many representations in, in, in this for some set 4X. Okay. So, and, and this result was in, in, by, improved in 2010 by Sanders. Uh, and, and Sanders showed, I mean, a basically quasi polynomial version of this lemma and improved the dimension of V to N minus O of log to the power four of one over alpha. But Sorry, of, of the probabilistic version, he proved. So he proved the uh, like the existence of subspace, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, I mean with, with his help we we proved the probabilistic version in, in, in this work. Got it. Cool. Uh, Sorry, was this probabilistic version studied before or just in your work? Uh, at, at least in uh, Sanders' version, I think it, it was originally. I mean, I think we studied it for the first time. Okay. So uh, okay. So having this uh, prolific probability of lemma, and, and just to say for, for, for the rest of the presentation, I'll just focus on uh, on the case where, where co-dimension co of B is one over alpha squared. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, the standard version. So let, let's uh, return to matrix multiplication. So we define the set X to be a set of good matrices B. And we already saw that if, if, if the input B belongs to X, then we're good. So if B does not belong to X, let, let's define this subspace V. And, and this subspace uh, comes from the probability probability of lemma. And now if we assume that B, which does not belong to X, belongs to V, then we can sample a representation for B from, uh, from basically members of X. So we can write B as M1, M2, M3, M4. We're gonna sample them uniformly at random. And we hope that uh, all four of them at the same time belong to X. And we know that this, uh, this happens with probability uh, greater than alpha to the power five. And then we can compute this. I mean, we, we can write this matrix, uh, a matrix multiplication as, as some of uh, these four like sub multiplications. And if, again, the, the like, good thing about matrix multiplication is that if uh, this like sampling that we, we did wasn't like, Correct. Then we can actually verify the answer and do. It, I mean, repeat this process again. Right. Question here: Does the, the algorithm doesn't know X, and it also doesn't know B? Is that right? No. Yeah. No. That's that's correct. Okay. Cool. So we, we can basically repeat this uh, sampling process uh, I don't know, constantly, many times, one over alpha to the power of five, and, and get get uh, get the answer with high probability. So as, as Gautam mentioned, we, we actually don't know what X is or what V is. Uh, so we're just hoping that uh, we're just hoping that we can we can basically modify the input somehow that uh, they, they can fall into this subset or subspace. So we know that if B belongs to X or B belongs to subspace V. Uh, we're good, but if it doesn't belong to any of those two, we, uh, so we, we need to do something for that. Uh, so let's pause here for a moment and think uh, what, what would really gain from like converting this subspace, uh, converting this subspace, subset to a subspace. So. We know that our original like subset had like density alpha, but subspace B, I mean, it has even less density. But the good thing about V is that it has a structure. So although X could basically be any kind of adversar adversarially designed uh, subset from alpha score uh, matrices, but V has some V is a subspace, so it it must follow some structure. And we're going to use uh, 
uh, that structure to basically reduce the problem to uh, to some instance, instances that belong to X. And for that to work, we first need to show that uh, we basically have to prove this simple fact that if we have a matrix uh, L and we know that the matrix L is low rank, is rank, I mean, its rank is like K and we think of K again as a constant. And we also know the column decompositions of uh, L, then we can uh, compute A times O in times N squared times K. And uh, how is how does that work? So we basically, I mean, we know the first columns of, uh, like, I mean, assume that first k columns are uh, linearly independent. So we compute a times each one of those sing single columns one by one. This will take uh, k times n squared. And then for the rest, we, we don't do like the matrix uh, vector multiplication. We, we just take the, uh, take the linear combinations for the, for the rest of columns. And, and we, we can do that in n minus, n minus k times kn. Uh, shouldn't you compute like what combination of the previous columns there are? So we, we know the decomposition of uh, columns. Oh, okay. I mean, we basically will see that we actually construct this matrix. So so we basically sample k, uh, k random vectors, and then we sample some random coordinates, and we construct linear combinations for the rest of columns. Okay. And let's return to the case three, where uh, B does not belong to the subspace V. Then we can write this as uh, basically, sum of a low rank matrix L that we construct plus B minus L or B plus L. I mean, it's a uh, binary field, so it doesn't really make any difference. And so we assume that L has rank K and we can set K to be like 10 times uh, one over alpha, some, something that only depends on alpha. And then, uh, We will see that, I mean, it's not really hard to see that this V, uh, I mean, this B minus L belongs to V with, uh, with some probability that only depends on, uh, on K or alpha basically. And, and this is, this is uh, where the exponential dependence from uh, alpha that we talked about in the beginning of the presentation comes from. And intuitively we can, we can think of it as, uh, so, so we know that this V has a co-dimension equal to uh, one over alpha squared. So we can assume that it has one over alpha squared linear constraints on, on the entries. And suppose, for example, I mean, those linear constraints are like the first, I mean, one, one entry should be equal to zero or one, two entry should be equal to zero, something like that. And because we're adding these uh, random columns to this matrix, uh, with probability one half, we will change the, that uh, coordinate that we have a constraint on to something that satisfies the constraint. Okay, is, is that is that clear? And because this B minus L belongs to V, this basically reduces to a case two of, of, of this algorithm. So we compute the first. Uh, a times L in time K N square. And we, we use the original algorithm to, to, do, to, do, to compute A times B minus L. Uh, sorry, one sec. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, just to check my understanding. So for the intuitive facts about the series to minus K probability, um, is one technical hurdle that has to be dealt with in the formal proof that like L does not have independent problems. It's, has no rank, so you know maybe combining these probabilities is not trivial because after some problems you're constrained about the rest of them and how they interact with the linear constraints of V. Uh, so so I mean the the, the formal proof is actually not very really far from this because uh, 
I mean, as I said, we have one over like alpha squared linear constraints on, on the entries of matrix. So we can think of it as like a, a matrix of size one over alpha squared times, uh, maybe, maybe I can write it down. If, So if, if, if I mean if we I mean if we, if this is our matrix B, we can we can think of it as like a vector of uh, length uh, n squared, right? So and this is something uh, so this is basically the matrix of linear constraints, right? So if we like and, and this is like a very fat matrix, and if we like diagonalize this matrix, we get some uh we get some coordinates in the matrix that only uh are only related to one constraint so this probability comes from the fact that if, if we add this uh low rank matrix and if we set the rank to be like 10 times one over alpha square with, with some good probability we will hit each one of these uh uh columns that this like con these coordinates belong to and with probability one half we will actually set it to be uh, something that satisfies the constraint. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Sure. The main point is that you only need to construct, like, you just sample the first kind of K rows of, of your matrix L, and then in the end, you take, like, any, because uh, the first K rows of your matrix L will, are, are enough, right? Like, yeah, yeah, and then you, you do. And then the uh, other combinations, like, why are they important? Because I mean, they're so okay. We, we don't we don't need. Uh, so so it might I mean it might be the case that I don't know in this like first first few like coordinates of this row is zero, right? I mean it's not exactly oh, like a one one two two three three four it can be one one uh, two like. 1000 and so on and so forth. Right, right. I see. So the other rows are just to say, okay, my constraints could have been in the other columns. And then you just yeah. kind of you pick the first k at random and then you sample from this sample here. You, you just do like sums of these columns. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the point is that, uh, I mean, no, no matter what, what these like coordinates are, they belong to at most k columns, right? Mm -hmm. And we hope that those like k columns with high probability are linearly independent. Uh, okay, so this is any any other questions? Okay, so so this is basically it. So we 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 show that if B belongs to X, uh, then I mean we can original. I mean we can use the original algorithm, and if B belongs to V, we can use uh, the lemma. And if B doesn't belong to V, we can do this like low rank shift, and then use uh, use the lemma again to, to solve the problem. And we, I mean, we were able to do this kind of shift because now we're dealing with the subspace. I mean, if it was like a subset, then we, we couldn't say anything about the structure. Uh, uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to deal with that case. So, okay, let me summarize uh, what we did. So we show that if uh, the original algorithm has a success rate with alpha, where alpha can be like sub constant, but here we think of it as a constant, then we can construct an algorithm alg star that, I mean, alpha square cancer with high probability for all possible inputs. And alg star runs in like times, in a time like two to the power alpha times t, where t is like the runtime of the original algorithm. And then uh, the guarantee is that alp star succeeds on basically all of us problems. So again, I mean, this kind of technique can be viewed from like two different perspectives. So in, in the like algorithms view, we, we can like use these reductions to, uh, to hope for constructing better algorithms for, uh, for some problems, because we just, we just need to, 
for example, for matrix multiplication, we, we just need to construct an algorithm that works on basically a tiny percent of what's all inputs. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, so uh, over there, you should say O alpha Tn plus x squared, right? Where? Uh, in the in the computer, no, about the yeah, the Tn is always about x squared. But it is mm -hmm. assume anything like that, right? I think it's implicit, right? Your Tn is greater or equal than x squared, right? I mean, it has to be, right? I mean, right, that's right. like the trivial yeah, yeah, number. That's it. I mean, but you, I mean, you already know that uh, that you can't have an algorithm that runs in time less than x squared, even if you want it, want it to be correct. Some on some fraction of the input. What is that something? I mean, you, you have so to read your input, input, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, I talked about algorithms. We are in, in the horn sphere. So, this basically shows that, uh, I mean, constructing an algorithm to like do matrix multiplication in time n squared, even for like 1% of possible inputs, is, is basically as hard as, as do it for uh, all inputs. So let me let me conclude by mentioning a few open problems. So I said that Sanders proved the a quasi polynomial version of uh, Bugatti Wolf's lemma. So we don't know whether it's possible to uh, prove a polynomial version where basically called the dimension of V is O of like one over alpha. And it's interesting to know whether we can possible uh, whether whether it's possible to uh, do like similar reductions. For example, what if uh, what if the algorithm? So so let me let me put it this way. What if the guarantee that we have for for the given algorithm is that it outputs the correct answer on, on just some tiny fraction of entries of, of the input uh, of the output? So is it is it possible to basically uh, show a reduction from like that weak algorithm to that, that like weak average case algorithm to a worst case algorithm or not. And also, so, so this matrix multiplication is uh, like very decent example for, uh, for, for this type of reduction because we, we know we have like efficient verification for this. So it's interesting to know whether we can use this uh, reduction for different type of algorithms where I ideally, we would like to like get rid of this efficient verification. And yeah, with that, I can, I can finish my presentation. Thank you. So that slide, with your open problem one there, like this polynomial, if, suppose you had that, would that, be, that, would that give you de-randomization of this uh, approach or like, well, why is that interesting? So I mean, it's it's in own. Uh, I mean, it's in on, it, on its own. It's very interesting. In, uh, I know it's a very interesting problem in uh, additive combinatorics, but it will also improve the dependence on alpha in in, in hard work. Sure. Uh, sorry, you do you want a probabilistic polynomial vector or just like the? Yeah. Okay. How hard is it? To polynomial conjecture to how hard is it to go just from the original Bogolyov's theorem to the probabilistic one? Is it hard or is it easy? Uh, okay, I mean, I, I don't really know how to. I mean, it's, it's not like trivial, in, but I mean, it's, it's doable, I think. I mean, it kind of depends on, on, the, on, on the way that you, you uh, prove this result, but uh, from Sanders's result to proving a probabilistic uh, version of that, I mean, it, takes three pages of proof, I guess. But I, I, I know this like problem has been open for like many years. And I, it will have like very uh, interesting con consequences about in, in additive combinatorics related to like Feynman Roja of open, open conjecture, uh, something like that. Can you say more about, you mentioned some other applications, right, besides being multiplication? Uh, did, did you mention other applications? Yeah, so the other applications that we had are basically, I mean, are mostly in the form of data structure setting because, so, so the good thing about data structures is that we can, we can do some pre-processing before, before uh, like 
answering the main questions that we are that we are asked. And why, why is that helpful? Because we can uh, we we can get some knowledge about about uh, about the subspace by by running some algorithm like uh, Goldberg Levin. But we know that the Goldberg Levin's runtime is like and I mean it's polynomial, but it's it's, it's much higher than n, n squared or n cubed. So that's why it's not helpful in the matrix multiplication case. But in the in for example online matrix vector multiplication, uh, when we know the matrix beforehand, when we can do some pre-processing, we can actually like find some uh, basis for that subspace. I mean with, with, with like high probability, and then given a vector, we can we can uh, write that as write that vector as sum of uh, as sum of basically a sparse vector and like four other vectors that belong to that subspace. Uh, there was uh, one part in your proofs where you were focusing on good A's. Uh, you were fixing A yeah. in such a way that um, the promise was that uh, the fraction of B's for which the algorithm succeeds uh, is at least an alpha. Uh, going beyond that, is it difficult? Uh, not, not really. So we have to do this basically the same uh, uh, the same reduction for A. And then by doing that, we get four matrices that we assume that belong to the, to the good subspace, right? And then we have to do this self-reduction for those four matrices individually. And we hope that all four of those belong to, uh, belong to basically the intersection of all those four subspaces. So it's, it will be a bit, I guess, messy, but uh, I mean, it basically follows from the same technique. So is this um, Bogoli evolved on conjecture? Is that or lemma? Is that the additive combinatorics part? Yeah, that's that's basically a uh, known tool in additive combinatorics to prove this result. Yeah. Um, just a quick question: Is it so naively a lot of these local correction stuff uh, is fairly. Um, Dependence on the finite closed structure. Do you think there's any hope of carrying this strategy over to something like Gaussian or like uh, in from your ball or something continuous like that, or are they do they seem fundamentally different? Uh, that's that's a good question. So we actually thought about that a little bit. I mean, uh, I I don't think it's very easy to. Uh, to basically adopt this to work on that setting, but um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I, we thought about it for like a little bit, but we didn't get much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Is there any work in the chat that I can't see? But uh, I mean, I also can't. There aren't any. Okay, well, okay, well then let's thank Mahesh. Uh,